Welcome to Submarine Live, and it's been an amazing week of sharing the science and adventure of the submersible exploration being conducted by Necton First Ascent. They are currently out in the middle of the Indian Oceans around the Seychelles, and we have been some, having some amazing submarine Q&A sessions with them. It's also been great to be doing our live investigations where we've been looking at some of the STEM topics uh, behind, behind the uh, submarine exploration. So it's been really, really amazing. And uh, currently, um, they are an incredibly remote expedition and we are, and they've had a squall, so a storm has come through over the vessel as they've been moving between sites and we're just currently looking to see if we can connect to them. Now, we've got some shout outs and some amazing uh, schools joining us this morning. And we have um, schools from the UK, Portugal and Mexico. Uh, and some special shout outs as well to Class 6V at Lauderdale Junior School and Mr Spray's class at Lauderdale School have said good luck with your mission and we'll definitely pass that on to the scientists when we get them online. We have Clara and Jennifer who are lined up to speak to us this morning. And we hope you find lots of cool new species. And we'll come on to the process of discovering new species in just a little bit. Um, Lauderdale Junior School are fantastic to have you on board. So a big wave to all the classes there um, who are joining this morning. Uh, we have Door Primary School. Good morning to everyone there. Uh, and we have EB23 de Galitha and University of Cambridge Primary School. And a big thank you um, for joining us this morning. Great to have you with us. Um, Submarine Live, part of Axel XL Oceans Education. And really, really fantastic to be able to share this with you. Now, I think we're just um, going to see whether we can get the scientists uh, from the research vessel online, from Ocean Sapphire. Uh, they've been doing some amazing work. Um, so that has been using submersibles. So Necton First Descent is called First Descent because it is looking deeper into our ocean and going down on these first descents where nobody has ever been before. So just to give you a rough idea about exploring our ocean. So at the top, we have the section of ocean that you can explore using scuba gear or an aqualung, and that has been over the past decades. So really that is uh, thinking about um, the top 30 meters, 20 to 30 meters. If you are a technical diver or a specialist diver, you could maybe even get down to 100 meters or lower. So really 30 meters for normal scuba, 100 meters for technical divers. Now, what happens if you want to discover what's going on even deeper? Well, we need to use, use other technologies. And some of those technologies include submersibles and ROVs. And to give you a sense of what those are, I think we may have um, some footage of one of the Necton submersibles. They're using uh, submersibles made by an organization called Triton. And to give you a sense of what it's like for those to be exploring the underwater world. And you can see, um, we'll get that footage up, an amazing experience to be exploring that round, that's round sort of almost goldfish bowl pressure hull made out of acrylic and that's about eight centimeters thick and what this does down to a depth of 250 meters is allow the scientists to have an amazing 360 degree view of the underwater world and it's designed also that that acrylic sphere is sort of disappears the optics of it mean that you don't feel separated um, when you're down in the deep. And all the scientists have been down have described how amazing that feeling is to be able to experience those depths where no one has ever been before. Now to go even lower and explore even further down, the team are using something called an ROV. 
and that stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle, uh, basically a robot submarine. And I've got one of those here. Now, you can probably see at the front there, you've got this sort of little dome, and behind that is a camera. And this is attached to the surface vessel um, by a uh, cable, and that can send signals back up to the surface. So you can use this to scooch around even deeper and to see some of the life and the habitats down at depth. Much like uh, many submersibles, um, it has battery pods, ballast tanks, and also has uh, thrusters on it. You can see the thruster on the top there that enables the uh, ROV to move up and down. And then on the back, you can see that we've got the thrusters there to move forwards and backwards. I'll just put that down here. They've got a slightly bigger one on the expedition rated to go down even deeper than this one. So what we can see from using these different tools is that we can explore more of the ocean down to the depths of 250 meters with the submersibles, down to a depth of 500 meters with the ROV. And that takes you from 30 to 250 to 500. So we're finding out more about what's down there. But this is still only scratching the surface. And there is so much more of the ocean to explore, going all the way down to about 11 kilometers down. And to give you a sense of comparison, the height of Everest is 8,850 uh, meters. So if you got Everest, turned it upside down, put it in the ocean, there would still be a couple of kilometers between the top of Everest and the bottom of the ocean. And that's the Marianas Trench, the Challenger Deep in the Marianas Trench. So an incredible part of the world to explore. And we're just going to see whether we can get the um, expedition team online. And I'm just seeing Gem is, is doing all the connections on this end. And I'm just going to say, good, good morning, good morning, Necton team. Good morning, Jamie. <laughs> good morning, fantastic um, to have you with us. And apparently you've had a Thank storm you. come through. Yes, we had a storm this morning, but it's over now, it's cleared out. Fantastic. I've, I've just, uh, we've got some amazing schools. Um, um, joining us this morning, we've got schools from the UK, Portugal and Mexico. So a big thank you to the Mexicans for, for getting up so early. Um, can I just ask you to, to introduce um, yourself and to share a little bit um, about your role on the expedition? Hi, my name is Clara and I am from the Seychelles. I work with the Seychelles Fishing Authority as a research technician. So my job is to assist scientists, local and international, when they come in with their projects. So the projects are really broad. So I tend to assist them with everything from oceanography to fisheries science and a little bit marine biology and ecology as well. Um, I've joined the expedition because the Seychelles Fishing Authority, alongside with the Necton team, is working on zooplankton analysis. So we're using a, the nets to drag on the side at the back of the boat, we collect zooplanktons. they are small microorganisms that you can see when you drag the net and you put them, concentrate them in a collecting bottle. And we're going to use these samples to um, do trophic analysis with them. So, um, and trophic analysis is basically we just, yes? So no, carry on, trophic analysis. Yes, trophic analysis is just that we're basically going to find um, the interrelationship between zooplankton and fish so we can integrate into a, an existing project that the SFA is doing. I mean, that, that's amazing. We've, we've got a lot of elementary schools watching this morning. So if I'm understanding you, that at the surface of the ocean where you're dragging these nets are these tiny creatures um, all the way yes. from baby animals and, and larvae to sort of miniature 
sort of crustaceans sort of related to lobsters like the copepod. Yes. And those are super important in food chains. So can you briefly explain yeah, how, that, how that food chain works and why these mini creatures are so important to fish and then to people? Yes. So these mini creatures on the surface of the ocean, they are very rich in fat that is good for humans and they are able to um, to convert the fats into um, so, so we can eat them so they play a vital role in the food chain in the food web marine marine food web because fish eat them and then the energy gets transferred from one fish to another and then when we fish we eat the fish obviously and this energy gets transferred to us so, so we, we are essentially eating uh, many beasts from the ocean, but they've been eaten and gone up the food chain um, to be a little bit bigger and the fish that we catch. That's exactly what it is. Fantastic. Uh, as it remains, uh, uh, a, a very important um, study, study to have. We've got some um, questions um, coming through, first of all, uh, from Oak Class. Um, in, in the UK and, and these would be sort of about, about the sort of expedition um, in general but also please feel free to speak um, from your winder experience. I know you have huge experience of working in the Seychelles. Um, the first question is what is the most interesting thing you have found in the sea? Um, the expedition or in general? Go, 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 go. Why do we have both? Okay, so I've, I actually find everything interesting because the ocean, there's a lot of things living down there. It's beautiful, it's colorful, and every um, animal that you encounter with is interesting in their own way. So far um, on this expedition, um, some scientists have been down in the sub and I've heard that they saw a six gill shark a treasure shark and a sunfish. These are very interesting animals to see, yes. Um, I think we've got uh, some imagery, some footage of the sunfish, just so our students watching can see how amazing it is. But you, you, you've mentioned something there, a six gill shark. Is, 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 is are six gills special? I mean, wh why, why is this? You know, and, and, and maybe briefly describe what gills are as well. Uh, gills are um, they're basically what helps fish or mammals um, breathe underwater. So a six gill shark is different from any other sharks because they tend to live a little bit lower in the water column. So that helps them to breathe easier. Um, that because it's, there's a lot of pressure at the bottom of the sea and that's the reason why it makes them different. So you find that the, the more gills, more ability to breathe and, and amazing adaptations you get deeper. Do you, do you get seven gill sharks even deeper? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but fun to, to, to see that, we, that the team have not only exploring the small creatures on the surface of the, of yes. the ocean, but these amazing uh, large creatures also creatures in, in, in into the sea. Yes. Um, the next question we have is um, relating to that. Um, how do creatures, I mean, we've talked about one adaptation, but the question is from Oak Class, what is the difference between creatures at the top of the sea and creatures at the bottom? How are those different? Um, creatures at the top of the sea, um, they're a bit closer to um, to the sun, the sun because um, from the water column, let's say from zero to 30, where scuba divers can go down, um, there's a lot more life. But when you go beneath 30 meters, there's a lot less sunlight. So these creatures, they have um, creatures from the deep ocean, they have different adaptations compared to the water at the top. Um, for example, if we talk about um, pelagic fishes, uh, fishes, I know they are the ones that are big like tuna, trevelies, sharks, they tend to live at the bottom and the ones at the top, 
like bonefish, um, let's say red snappers, they're the ones that um, they tend to live on the bottom, uh, sorry, uh, closer to the surface. Closer to the surface. So by pelagic, we mean yeah. those, those fish that live in the water column um, rather than on, on the bottom itself, um, which I think the technical term we use is benthic, I think. And then benthic, have, yeah. And then th we have those surface ones as well. If you go really deep into the ocean, what kind of adaptations, so say we go down to a thousand meters down, what kind of adaptations might we find down there? Mm, I think there's a few. I can't really, I'm not really sure about all of them, but I know that some of them, they have um, vision, you know, their eyes are different and their gills are different like the sharks and um, they have to they have uh, better ways to temperate the regulate their body temperature because deeper is a lot colder than when you're um, to on the surface of what is warmer and, and what I find amazing also is is and I know some of the uh, scientists have spoken about bioluminescence um, in the deep what's that, that is all about? An Bioluminescence is just something of uh, something that usually um, zooplankton, most of them, you know, the small tiny creatures, um, they emit this light, they light up the sea, and that's usually at night. But um, not all of them has this, just a couple species. So most of the time, the bioluminescence is due to what they eat. Okay, it's due to what they eat. And then um, at night, it's just that they light up, and it seems like they're 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 ex um, expressing light or something. So the the color um, depends on what they've been eating. Yeah, amazing. So they eat eat, eat sort of like uh, glowing food, and you end up glowing. Yes. Great. Um, so another question from Oak Class. Um, what was it like? Uh, have you have you been down in one of the submarines, and and what was it like for the first time? Yes, I have been. Um, it was it was amazing. It was a really really great experience. It was I've never done it before, obviously. So just being able to get the opportunity to sit in the sub and go down, and and I really don't have words for it. But if you must know, down there it's really peaceful, it's beautiful, everything is moving along so slow, even time is slow at the bottom of the sea. So I was really nervous at first, but um, it was a beautiful experience, and that, that's, that's how, how good it was. Amazing. Uh, it sounds like it, it's just a, another world down there. Um, We've, we've got some um, questions coming through from Lauderdale Junior School and a really lovely question, uh, the first question up, if you were a sea creature, which one would you be and why? Oh wow, that's a good question. Um, I'll probably be a turtle. Uh -huh. Because, yeah, because they are really laid back animals and they live up to a hundred years old and they just go about their day doing you know they swim around and they're beautiful and I think a lot of word out there is like um, turtles are really wise so I would like to be a sea creature with wisdom. Fantastic I mean we've got a sort of footage of one of the uh, green turtles that was uh, uh, in the shallows yes. around Aldabra um, which uh, an amazing experience to be in the water with them. Um, Lauderdale Junior School would also like to know uh, how do you name new species? So if you find a new species, how do you give it a name? Um, so we need to identify a few things on them if they have specific um, things that we can point out then we can choose which family they come from and then we can move from there from there. But if there's something really new, then the scientists will have to come up with something um, with a new name. And maybe they can relate it to something that is similar, or they can just name 
something new. They can give it a new name. And that's that, how it works. That could be usually. anything from from your your a friend's name to a to a name of an island or whatever you yes, choose. Yes. Yes. Are there any rules? Whatever you, you choose. I think I've heard the one rule is you're not allowed to name it after yourself. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good rule. That's true. I'm not sure about that one. I mean, maybe it's, it's just a shared, you know, idea rather than a set rule in the science world. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, another question coming through um, from Lordell Junior School is uh, what is the rarest creature that you have discovered and were they related to any other creature that we know of? That I have discovered personally or on the expedition? Or the expedition or other expedition. teams you've been part of, yeah. Hmm. I'm not really sure, but I, I know that um, the team here on the boat, they're really, really, um, they're still talking about the shark and the sunfish and they're hoping to see um, another sunfish eventually along the expedition as the expedition moves along and I think these are really rare creatures but we're hoping to find other ones as well. I mean you know one of the interesting things that I find about these expeditions is that students often think that it, there are a lot of eureka moments so you can go down into the deep ocean and you can spot a fish or you can spot a coral or a sponge and go, aha, we have found a new species. But that's not the case. I mean, you, you can certainly collect video footage of a lot of animals or you can collect small physical samples of some of the um, animals living on the seafloor. But it takes a long time to find out whether that's actually a, a species new to science. What, what's the process that would happen after an expedition like this? Um, well, let's say we go down in the sub and we find something new. Or most of the time, um, there are some things that we see that some scientists have been looking for a long time. So it's sort of a really big deal to be a big discovery for them. So we usually take the samples out from the sub and then we go into the lab. We work as fast as possible to get the samples into containers, we remove um, whatever um, bits and pieces we need from them and then we store them as quickly as possible depending on what kind of analysis they're going to use for. And then it's it, it sort of, you know, uh, months afterwards of potentially comparing that, that sample to other samples held in collections, maybe doing some DNA analysis and only then being able to state whether it's a species new to science. Yes, that's exactly what happens. A few months after, we compare the samples and we see they, they fall into the same class or family or new genus, uh, species, sorry. So you can see if they, they have a relationship between each other. I mean, it's, 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 so this is, this is the start. So we're looking forward to, so to students watching, we'll, we'll keep on bringing you up to date uh, with any of the new species that are discovered on this expedition. And I think on the previous Nectin mission, there were over 100 new species discovered. Um, just um, going back to Lordale Junior School, some, some great um, couple of uh, questions coming in. On, on, on a personal uh, level, why did you want to research uh, marine life? Well, that's a really good question. Um, growing up on an island, just basically I've been, I've been in the water ever since I can remember. So I've been snorkeling and I, I remember being so interested with what I can see from below the surface of the water. So I think this is where the interest um, started. And then after I went to school and I continued my studies, doing my A-levels, I decided to go work at the fishing authority and I just like discovering new stuff and the marine field, you can't go wrong with that. There's always something new coming up. Even if you've seen something once or twice and you're going to see it again, it's always so nice to see. It's amazing. Um, so, uh, Jamie, I'm, yes. I'm going to pass you to my friend Jen now. Jennifer. Okay. Jennifer. Yes. We're switching halfway and Jennifer is ready for you. 
fantastic. Good morning, good afternoon. I want to say thank Jennifer. you too. Thank, thank you so much, Clara. It's thank been you. Fantastic See you. Having you. Um, thank you. Hi, Jamie. Good morning. How are you? Good afternoon, in fact, where you are. <laughs> yes, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I am. I'm all right. I'm all right. Having a good day and uh, nice weather here on, uh, in the Seychelles. So, yeah, everything's going great. Everything's going great. It's fantastic to hear. Um, Jennifer, we've had some great uh, questions answered by Clara. Um, just, just for the schools who are watching, we've got um, elementary schools across the UK, Portugal, um, and we've got a school from Mexico um, dialing in this morning, uh, this afternoon. Uh, could you just introduce yourself uh, to the schools and your role on the expedition? Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer and uh, I come from the Seychelles. I work with the Seychelles Islands Foundation. So this is an organization um, that manages the UNESCO World Heritage Sites of Seychelles. We have two. Uh, World Heritage Sites in Seychelles, which is the Valle de May and Aldabra Atoll. Uh, and I join, I'm on the Nectan expedition, um, I'm on the research team, so I'm assisting with uh, all the data collection and all the sampling going on down in the waters. Uh, amazing, and, and we, this is an interesting question coming up from Lordell Junior School. And the scientific research isn't just for fun, isn't just to have a list of new species um, in a book. Um, but the question is, is why might the information you collect be important? Um, thank you, that's a very good question. Uh, it is actually very important because we don't know what's beneath the waves. Um, below 50 meters, it's everything. We, we're just finding out now. And we need to know that because we need to understand it. There's definitely connectivity between shallow and the deep. So we need to understand how the ocean works, how it's all connected. So that, of course, we need to protect the marine organisms and the marine habitats. Yeah. And, and fantastic that you know the, the research will lead into that action and protection. Uh, the the next question uh, coming through uh, um, is from Abdullah in Six MC. Good morning, Abdullah. Thank you very much for this question. Um, and it is: uh, if you've been down in a in a submarine, are you ever concerned that something would go wrong? <laughs> Thank you, Abdullah, for the question. Uh, yes, I actually two days ago got the opportunity to go down in the sub and I went down to 250 meters. That was a really amazing uh, experience. Um, of course, before we went in, we got the safety briefing of what will happen if there's anything wrong. So we were prepared and we were told how to bring the sub back up. So I was kind of the co-pilot and that was really, really cool. So no, I, I wasn't scared at all. And we, we were told very well in advance how to deal with e this situation in case it happens. But uh, luckily nothing happened. Luckily so. <laughs> nothing happened, touch wood. Uh, it sounds like it was a, yes. an amazing experience. Um, uh, this is from Jamila um, in 6MC. Good morning, Jamila. Um, what is your favorite aspect of your club, uh, of your job? Sorry. The favorite aspect of my job is being in the field, uh, doing the research, data collection. Um, that's the most amazing because you are, for example, if we're surveying fish, you're uh, monitoring uh, the fish in the sea. It's it's really amazing. You feel connected to the research you're doing, and then we go in the lab, and then it's the office work. But the field work itself is the most uh, amazing aspect for me. And I always find it funny. <laughs> although it's called field work, you're not in a field. You're you're on the ocean. Yes, yes, it is. yes, we are. <laughs> um, this is a a question um, from Oak Class. We've had a lot about plastic pollution um, in the media in the UK over the past year or so. And the question is, why is litter damaging the ocean? Uh, well, um, definitely now we're seeing a lot of research coming up on how it's impacting the ocean, either directly through ingestion of plastic by the marine organisms, or um, also um, for example, it gets washed up on beaches. Um, I think it's mostly because um, uh, waste mismanagement 
like um, it, not all countries have proper waste disposal or waste management system in place. So all of that is getting uh, is reaching the ocean and then it's, it's accumulating in remote places like here in the Seychelles and it's becoming a really big problem. Yeah. Uh, and the the ingestion by marine organisms by that we mean that uh, seabirds um, like an ibis or uh, an albatross marine mammals like whales yeah. um, they are yeah. eating um, this this yes. plastic and it's ending up in their stomachs and, and, and blocking um, their stomachs okay we, we are on on a um, variable connection to the ocean surface so we'll, we'll just come back um, to Jennifer uh, when we get the connection back up um, it's wonderful to be able to bring um, these scientists who are in the middle of the Indian Ocean live to you guys um, but obviously <laughs> um, it is it is the, 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 the mobile signal and the internet signal are, are a little bit variable uh, when you're I think there are 1100 kilometers uh, from the nearest international airport, they are really in remote regions finding out what's down there for the first time. Um, just while we are um, raising the connection again, uh, we have a couple of questions which I, I will be able to, to answer. Um, first off, from Oak Class, uh, how many submersibles are on the expedition? Really great question, thank you very much for that. Um, there are two submersibles. Um, they are Triton 1000-2s, and that means they are rated to a depth of 1,000 feet, and they carry two people. Um, so that would be the pilot and a scientist, researcher, who is also the co-pilot on this type of expedition. Uh, one of them is uh, red. Um, that's Omega Seamaster, and the other one is yellow, and that's Kensington, um, the second submersible. Uh, we have um, next up um, Chris uh, from Stratford Academy. Good morning, Chris. Um, great to have you with us. Um, what do you think is the most important thing we need to understand about the oceans? Chris, it's, it's, it's a really, really great question. And there are several layers um, to unpick there. I mean, I think that the first thing we need, to, the most important thing we need to understand about the oceans um, is that they're vast. They're huge, one interconnected ocean. You look at the planet from space and it looks like a blue planet. And that vast ocean supplies us with so much. It supplies us with half of the oxygen we breathe supplies billions of people uh, with food um, from fishing. It regulates our climate. It absorbs heat and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. But in its vastness, we have always thought that it is too big to be disrupted by human behavior. And what we're finding now is in fact that's not true, that we are impacting it. So I think it's fast, we are changing it, but it's beautiful and we should care for it. I don't know that's more than one thing, um, but Chris, it's, it's a really, really great question and, and something to reflect on further um, in your class. Uh, Mike from Surrey, uh, what can we all do to help the life in the ocean? Mike's a, a really, really good question. I mean, I think that there are, there are sort of an, a number of issues um, face, facing the ocean, uh, but we can, we can pick out um, uh, a few of them. I think that what we can look at is how we uh, eat, how we live, and how we travel. Because if we reduce our impact on the ocean in terms of just having sustainable food or having more of a plant-based diet, that's going to be great. Um, because we need healthy um, uh, levels of animals, fish in the ocean. And in terms of um, how we um, travel, that's really a sort of shorthand for reducing our carbon emissions. Um, and increased levels of carbon dioxide are, are harming um, the oceans all over the planet. 
So even if you're not near um, a coral reef, you can do something to prevent some of the bleaching, and we can explain bleaching later um, on this broadcast. Um, and the last thing is, is, is how we live, what we buy. And we had a conversation just there looking at the impact of marine litter. But I just got a, a, a thumbs up, and I think we have Jennifer uh, back Hi, Jamie, line. can you hear me? Jennifer, I can hear you coming through loud and clear. <whistles> loud and clear for 15 seconds. Um, so we'll come back, um, we'll continue to uh, try and raise uh, Jennifer on the satellite link, uh, and uh, we'll uh, look at some more of these questions coming through. Um, we have um, f from Sarah at 6MC Lauderdale. Good morning, Sarah. Lovely to have you with us. Um, is the Indian Ocean more damaged? Are you? Jennifer, you're back. Hello. Hello, hello. I, I'm going to, um, until I get you receiving testing loud and clear um, through my um, earpiece here, I am going to continue to, um, to try and address some of these uh, questions coming through um, from the students. Um, I'm going to leave the Indian Ocean um, question when Jennifer comes back online, working on uh, sort of world heritage sites around the Seychelles, so really involved. Um, in conserving the Indian Ocean areas uh, for future generations. And I'm going to come on to a great question, uh, which is how do you control the submarine? And I wonder who asked that question because it's an absolutely brilliant question. And we have been covering uh, some of the STEM topics um, behind uh, exploring with submersibles. And there are a number of ways. So ultimately, you've got, you've got a joystick and it's a bit like flying um, uh, a, a plane, so you're moving in three dimensions. So you are a pilot doing that. Um, and the way that works is you're controlling the thrusters. So I'm just going to hold up this ROV here. And you can see on the top, there's a thruster that moves you up and down. And then on the back, you can see those two thrusters moving you backwards and forwards. The other thing to think about is buoyancy, so how that affects you moving up and down through the ocean. And what happens there is that you have um, the ability to change, you've got tanks on the side, and you've got the ability to change the amount of air or water in those tanks. And that changes your buoyancy in the water, so it assists you in ascending or descending through the ocean uh, by changing the dens overall density of the submersible. Wow, um, Omar at 6MC. <laughs> what skills are required to become a scientist? Uh, really, really uh, great question. So first of all, you've got the academic side. So you'll find that most of the scientists, or all of the scientists um, working on this expedition have gone through a sort of an academic um, progress. And that's all the way through from GCSE to A-level to your undergraduate degree, studying science subjects, biology perhaps, um, and then specializing maybe further with a marine biology master's and perhaps even a, a higher degree, a doctorate, a PhD. And so from leaving school, that could be a process of anywhere between sort of, you know, three, five, eight years, depending on how far you go through those different qualifications. But speaking about uh, some of the other uh, side of being a scientist, if you want to be a field scientist, really important that you get out and volunteer with nature groups, get out into the field, really enjoy nature. And you're not going to succeed as a scientist unless you have a passion for what you're studying. Uh, so it doesn't have to be marine science or the coral reef. It could be the woodlands near where you are or the coastal regions or mountains or deserts or wherever. But you really need to have a passion for it because you've got that skill of going out and collecting the data. So going out to these amazing places, good sense of humor because you're working with a lot of people in a remote environment and it's often quite stressful. 
So there's a lot of needing to be patient and having a high level of accuracy as well to make sure that the samples you take can end up being shared and help our understanding of the planet. So lots involved there. Uh, but um, Omar, really hope that you might consider following uh, a career in science. And I think we have um, Jennifer back with us. Yes, Jennifer. sorry about that. <laughs> no problems. Hi, how are you? Um, just, just there's just some, a really great question um, coming through from uh, Sarah um, at Lauderdale Junior School. And, and Sarah wanted to know, is the Indian Ocean more damaged than other oceans? Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, actually, I think uh, it is as damaged. I'm not really sure if it's more or less, but I think it's equally as damaged as the rest of the other oceans because we also have quite big populations living all around the Indian Ocean. So I think uh, the human impacts is quite similar to as we see in every other ocean. Yeah. So, so not, not a good news story. No, so unfortunately, no. I think uh, our impacts in the ocean are worldwide, and yeah, it's yeah, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's a questions coming through here. Um, oak class. So this, this is really um, um, coming to sort of like the the, the operations of, of submarines. Um, they would like to know how do the people in the submarine communicate with people at the surface? Um, uh, we have a direct line to the bridge and using a radio. And uh, so every 15 minutes when we were down in the submarine, we had to do a safety check just to say that life support is good. And so it's quite clear communication and we can contact uh, the boat if, uh, if there's any problem and there's not like we're not completely cut off, so it's quite safe, actually. Yeah. So you've got that underwater radio that sounds pr pretty amazing. Yes. Yes, um, it is. And, and just in terms of the uh, sub submersible operations, how, how do you launch um, one of the submersibles? Because um, they're on the back of the boat most of the time, and I think we've got some overview footage maybe of, of those uh, submersibles on the back of the expedition vessel. Yes, so uh, the crane will uh, slowly lift up the submersible from the boat and put it on the side and lower it down very slowly in this, into the sea. And then we come around in the uh, small boat and this is when the, uh, the pilot and the passenger boards gets into the submarine. And when everybody's in, you close the hatch and then the pilot does his thing and we just dive down. Right, so, so I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot of teamwork, I think, involved. I and mean, I think you, you have a, 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 a the, the sort of deck crew and the, the, these things weigh four tons. Yes, exactly. So it's very good communication. Everybody has a radio on and, and directing uh, where to go and if to lower it down slower or it's so it's very, all very good um, um, teamwork. And I think they've, they've got it really, really well already. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, Jennifer, um, question coming through again from Oak Class um, asking, uh, what is your favorite sea creature? Oh, that's a good one. My favorite sea creature, um, I really, I'm really fond of sharks. Uh, that is not one creature, it's a group of fish. So I really, I really like uh, sharks because they are a highly endangered group of fish and I think uh, they really deserve more attention, the good kind of attention, because uh, we, need, we need sharks. They are very important in the food chain, in the sea, so I really love, really love the group of sharks, yeah. Amazing. Well, uh, very sadly, uh, that's all we have time for today, Jennifer. Thank you so much uh, for joining us, and thank you so much for your patience um, as we dealt with the... Um, communications of, of getting to you in, in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's fantastic to have you live into classrooms um, across the UK, uh, Portugal and Mexico. Um, really, really glad that you could spare the time out of what I know are very, very busy days. Um, so thank you so much and please thank 
all the Nexim team uh, for participating in these broadcasts. We've got just one more submarine Q&A to come up. So thanks, Jennifer, and have a great rest of Thank your you day. Thank you so much. Yes, likewise. Thank you for having me. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being part of this submarine Q&A this morning. It's been amazing to have all your great questions um, being sent through. Um, we've had Chris, Sarah, Jamila, Jamila, Abdullah. I've got some more names here. Omar, great question. Um, did I say Sarah? I mean, the school, you've really done a lot of great work in, in developing these. Sorry if I haven't given you a um, shout out. There's a long list on my screen here. Uh, we do have uh, just a few more um, sessions left of Submarine Live. We have a Submarine Pressure Live investigation coming up in just 15 minutes. Then at one o'clock, uh, we have a Submarine Q&A and followed by another um, go at Submarine Pressure at 2 p.m. UTC today. If you have been enjoying these sessions, please do post any images, um, share those, uh, Twitter, uh, we are at Encounter U, Encounter EDU, sorry, and hashtag Submarine Live. And please do follow up with Submarine Live in the classroom and join us in the Arctic, where we'll be from the 1st to the 8th of May for Arctic Live. Come and join us up there, and you can book for free online at www.encounteredu.com forward slash live until the next time we see you online thank you so much for being part of submarine live and it's a big bye 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 bye